Right. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming today to uh, the Behavioral Science and Health and Healthcare Seminar Series with Accords. Um, so I'm Bethany Kwan. Um, I lead the education program at Accords. Anyone here not familiar with Accords? I think there should be a few today who haven't heard of us before. Okay. Um, so uh, Accords, it stands for Adult and Child Consortium for Health Outcomes Research and Delivery Science, where the Health Outcomes Research um, program here, um, affiliated with the School of Medicine as well as Children's Hospital, um, Colorado. Um, and we are an interdisciplinary research shop where we do uh, all different sorts of what we call T3, T4, translational research, trans, um, and mostly translation to practice in communities. We have an education program that offers multiple seminar series and workshops per year on a variety of topics that are relevant to the T3, um, T4 translational research that we do. Um, today we have a um, special guest from Carnegie Mellon University and she's actually uh, presenting as both part of our behavioral science seminar series and our program. Our, um, Science of Patient-Centered Decisions seminar series. So we're mixing together a couple of our seminars uh, here today. Um, so Dr. Chapman is a professor of psychology in social and decision sciences at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Um, she's been there since 2017. And prior to joining the faculty at CMU or Carnegie Mellon, um, Dr. Chapman was a distinguished professor of, of psychology at Rutgers University, where she was department chair of psychology and the acting co-director of the Center for Cognitive Science. She's a recipient of an APA Early Career Award and a New Jersey Psychological Association Distinguished Career Award and a fellow of both APA and APS, American Psychological Association. Um, and she's a former senior editor at Psychological Science, a premier journal in psychology, a past president of the Psych Society for Judgment and Decision Making. Um, she's written more than 100 journal articles, well more than that now and the recipient of 20 years of continuous external funding. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gretchen Chapman. Thanks everybody, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so I'm a psychologist and a decision researcher who studies health behavior. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you today about leveraging automaticity for healthy behavior change. And I'll explain with the examples as I go through what I mean by auto automaticity. But basically what I mean is using uh, structures in the environment to drive the behavior rather than relying on deliberative uh, decision processes on the part of the patient or the person exhibiting the behavior. Um, in today's talk, I'm gonna zip through a whole bunch of studies, most of them not mine, to illustrate this. Uh, idea of automaticity and a couple of other ideas that I want to share with you. So it's like a lot of studies are going to go by fast without um, a lot of detail. So feel free to interrupt me and ask questions or ask questions at the end if you want more details about some of them, but I'm going kind of for a higher level. Default. So the main question that I'm going to talk with you today about is uh, how can we harness what we know about decision making and behavioral science to encourage healthy behavior. Um, vaccination behavior is one of my favorite uh, health behaviors to study, but not the only one we're going to talk about today. Uh, so decision researchers tend to make a contrast between rational standards of how people actually should make decisions and then behavioral data on how real people really make decisions. Um, and depending on how much of a divergence you think there are between those two worlds, you're going to come up with different suggestions for how to change behavior. Uh, so if you think people are mostly rational, uh, you could rely on the standard tools for behavior change like um, providing information or changing people's beliefs since their behavior presumably is a rational extension of, what, of the information they perceive. You could just give them new information like flu shots are safe and effective and then all of a sudden they would start getting flu shots. Um, if the sort of natural pros and cons of the behavior aren't already in their self-interest, you could add additional incentives and that would kind of tip the cost-benefit balance uh, and they would start exhibiting the behavior. Uh, and in, a, in situations where there's really no self-interested reason for the person 
to exhibit the behavior, but it's good for in a, in a group, at a group level, like paying taxes, then we have regulations. So now it's just required that I have to pay taxes, even though it's not good for me personally, it's good for all of us as a group if we all pay taxes. Uh, if you're a behavioral researcher and you don't think people are rational all the time, then those tools are maybe not going to be sufficient and in some cases could even be counterproductive. Um, so some of the tools that behavioral researchers uh, focus on are not just providing information, but thinking about the format in which we provided the information. So maybe the way you present the information is at least as important as the actual content of the information. Uh, in addition to just thinking about incentives that we could offer people, like sort of very explicit things like we'll pay you $10 if you get a flu shot, we can think of other consequences, especially social consequences that these behaviors have, like fitting in with my group or doing what everyone else is doing, and maybe those kind of social consequences could be very influential. Um, and since regulation is uh, sometimes divisive and not easily accepted, maybe there are some lighter touch, more behaviorally inspired interventions that we could use that I'm gonna call here automation. So structuring the environment in such a way that it sort of automatically guides you to the behavior without us actually having to require that you exhibit the behavior. Um, so the whole reason I'm here is because I met Allie Kemp a couple of years ago but not in person. We worked on this whole project without ever meeting face to face. Um, she and I and three other co-authors um, wrote this really long review article on how to use psychology to encourage vaccination behavior. And it's a really long article. You probably don't want to read the whole thing. So I'm just going to try to summarize it in like one or two slides. Uh, so uh, in our review, we looked at literature that, um, that categorized into three different sections. Um, so we could encourage vaccination behavior by changing what people believe about vaccinations or how they, what they, how they feel about them. It turns out there's relatively weak evidence for using that as a lever to increase vaccination behavior, both because it's hard to change people's beliefs and also because once you've changed their beliefs, they don't automatically just start exhibiting the behavior. A second category we looked at was social factors. Uh, so by that, I mean social norms, social comparisons, fitting in with a group, and there's a lot of really exciting social psychology research showing that these factors work, but not a lot of it on vaccination yet. Um, so we think that's a, a very hopeful avenue for future research. And then the area where there's the strongest evidence for increasing vaccination behavior is what we call intervening on behavior directly. And what we mean there is uh, the kind of automation stuff that I hope to emphasize to you today. So uh, how, can we, uh, how can we touch on people's behaviors without actually trying to change what they think or feel? So we don't really care what you think about the flu shot, we just want you to get it. How can we structure the environment in such a way that that's gonna, that that's gonna happen? Um, so just to flush that intervening on behavior directly out a little bit um, further, um, we know from a lot of behavioral research that there's often a gap between people's intentions to exhibit a behavior and then actually exhibiting the behavior. So if someone has favorable intentions, but they're just somehow not translating into behavior, uh, we can intervene on that behavior by building on those favorable intentions, for example, with reminders, prompts, and primes. Um, that would be a lot of Allie's work. Uh, we could reduce barriers with healthy defaults um, or with improved logistics, like making the vaccine really convenient. Uh, if someone doesn't have a particularly strong intention to vaccinate to begin with, then we can shape behavior with some of the more traditional tools of providing incentives um, or using sanctions or requirements when that's warranted. Uh, in our article, we had a chart of a bunch of um, interventions and we sort of rated them on how effective they were. These were some of the most um, uh, effective interventions for improving vaccination that we found from our literature review. Um, so provider recommendations, especially a, a kind of recommendation called presumptive recommendations that I'll explain to you in a, a, in a bit. Um, convenience things like on-site vaccinations that uh, reduce barriers, default vaccination appointments, I'll give you an example of that in a bit. Um, and then uh, the, the sort of traditional, um, more stronger interventions like um, providing incentives or requiring vaccination, which you don't want to do all the time, but there is evidence that they do work when you use them. Um, okay, as a final kind of opening motivation, um, I'll show you this slide from uh, another review article by Shlomo Bernardi and colleagues where they looked at cost effectiveness of a bunch of different interventions for not just vaccination, but I'm just showing you their, their vaccination um, subgroup here. Uh, so the, the two things and the two bars in dark here, planning prompt, nudge, 
I'll, I'll show you exactly that study um, shortly. And default appointment nudge, I'll also show you that study shortly. Um, those were pretty cost effective, um, both because they're cheap to implement and also because they're like kind of effective. Um, other more traditional things like um, on-site vaccinations, monetary incentives, education um, work, but aren't quite as cost effective. The, the education incentive, the education campaign here looks uh, very cost effective, but it actually had a big logistical component to it of just making the vaccines very convenient. So not sure that I would call that purely education. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to show you three different categories of uh, techniques we can use to change the behavior. So in the first one, we're just gonna look quickly at information format. And what I mean by that is, uh, it's not just what you say, but how you say it. Um, so some of this research is on uh, finding ways to present information that's really easy for patients to comprehend. So here's an example from the Harding Center for Risk Literacy about how to explain to men what are the benefits or lack of benefits for prostate screening. Um, so some kind of nicely organized chart like this, or even like a pictograph that shows you if, if you got screened and if you didn't get screened, like how likely would you be to die of prostate cancer or have um, die from something else or get unnecessarily treated. And you know, this kind of presentation makes it pretty clear that um, there's really not any net benefit of uh, early detection of prostate cancer. Um, so that's one example of, of the way in which we present the information. Um, another, there's a lot of research on framing effects, so you can frame the same information in different ways. So I'll just show you one um, example. This is a study by Meng Li, who's in our audience here. here. She's in uh, the Health and Behavioral Sciences Department, and she was a graduate student with me long ago. And this is, I think, the first study that we did together, uh, right after the Gar Gardasil got approved. And um, the first version of Gardasil was 70% effective um, it, it was completely effective against two strains of HPV that caused 70% of cervical cancers. So we figured that there were two honest ways to describe that. We could either say that it was 100% effective at preventing virus infections that caused 70% of the cancer cases, or we could say it's 70% effective at preventing virus infections that cause all uh, causes of, of the cancer. Um, and we just ask uh, lay people to to, to rate their intention to get vaccinated. There was no real vaccination behavior here. And they voiced stronger intentions for the first one because it's 100% effective against something. You can sort of don't even really care about what the something is. So um, just the different ways in which we present numbers can make them differentially influential. Um, uh, the the MyPlate um, description of dietary guidelines is another example. Like MyPlate is a lot easier for people to comprehend than the my pyramid. I mean, it's kind of the same base underlying recommendations of how much of different things you're supposed to eat. It's just easier to comprehend. So again, the way in which you present the information can be important. Um, and I'll show you one final example. This is a study I did with a nutritionist colleague of mine, uh, Peggy Palacastro, at a college dining hall where students could fill out this form to indicate what ingredients they wanted on their custom-made hoagie. Uh, and the right-hand uh, order slip here, we revamped so that within each category, the healthier options were on the top. So like multi-grain roll is a bit healthier than the other breads. Uh, and then the healthier ones were designated with a star to indicate that they were sort of being recommended. Um, and then we just uh, collected the slips to see what people were ordering. We don't actually know what they ate. We only know what they ordered. Um, so on this graph, the green things are the ingredients we were trying to encourage, and the red things were the ingredients we were trying to get people to eat in more moderation. And the height of the bar shows the difference between the two conditions. So we want the green bars to go to the right and the red bars to go to the left. And that's pretty much what's happening. I mean, there's a bunch that aren't changing at all, but when they do change, they go in the, in the correct um, direction. There was one exception, which was mayonnaise. It's unfortunate, it has a lot of calories. Um, <laughs> It totally wiped out any calorie savings at the intervention. We think there might be some moral licensing going on that we just ordered this turkey sandwich with lots of vegetables and no cheese on a whole grain roll. And then you figure like, I deserve to have some mayonnaise so it will be palatable. <laughs> so I think that's a, a sort of good cautionary message that um, our interventions don't always have a net effect the way we hoped because people can kind of react to them. Um, okay, so that was my whirlwind tour towards uh, information uh, format. Uh, let's talk a little bit about social context. So one of the ways in which the 
social ramifications of our behaviors affect us. Uh, so here's one famous study that social psychologists will know about. Um, so this is the Noah Goldstein, um, Bob Taldini study of hotel towel reuse. So you want to get um, hotel guests to hang up their towel and use it another day instead of just throwing it on the floor and getting a new one every single day. And they tried different messages. Um, and the ones that worked best were the ones that implemented social norms. So they said 75% of guests reuse their towels, which was in fact accurate based on a, um, some data collection they had done earlier. Um, or especially if you made that social norm proximal. So 70%, 75% of guests who were staying in this room, 429, the room you were staying in, reuse their towels. Um, then that was even a little bit more effective. So we all have a tendency to want to do what other people are doing. And if we get accurate information that everyone else is doing this thing, then uh, we have a tendency to want to do it as well. Um, so that's been implemented for things like electricity use. So a number of electricity companies now do this when you get your bill. They'll show you how much electricity you're using and they'll, they'll compare you to some reference point like all neighbors or efficient neighbors. And if you're using more than other people, then you'll want to cut back. Um, let's look at a couple more medically relevant examples of this. Uh, so this is a social norm study by Michael Hallsworth uh, on antibiotic prescriptions. So the physicians who were in the top 20% in terms of prescribing antibiotics either did or didn't get a message telling them that they were prescribing more antibiotics than 80% of other physicians. Um, and you can see the blue and red lines here, and the red line is a little bit lower than the blue line, so that's the effect of the social norm message bringing prescriptions down. So it's not huge, but it is real, and it did extend over a long period of time. Uh, here's a slightly different, but also very interesting uh, example of social norms. Um, so Jason Doctor did this study to reduce uh, opioid overprescription. So among physicians in California who had prescribed opioids to a patient and then the patient died from an overdose, they were randomized to either receive or not receive a letter from the medical examiner informing them that this, was, this is the patient you prescribed opioids to and they died from an overdose. Um, so they're getting this, you know, this feedback information about the social implications of their prescriptions and, and then they track their future prescriptions after, after the letter. Um, and, the, and their prescriptions um, came down a bit, that little negative 6.9 at the bottom there is the number of um, units of morphine reduced that was, was being prescribed. Uh, okay, here's another social norm implications. This is another Meng Lee study. Um, so kids in a school cafeteria were either given um, plates um, that had these part, these like divisions in them for different kinds of food with little pictures of the vegetables, kind of hinting like, hey, this is where you're supposed to put the vegetables. Subtext, you should be taking vegetables. Um, versus a regular plate that didn't have those pictures. And then they track how much vegetables kids were serving to themselves and also how much they were actually eating. And they served themselves and ate more vegetables when they had this kind of um, subtle implied norm message about what you're supposed to be eating. Uh, okay, final example of social stuff is a um, walking study that I did a few years ago. Um, so we use um, pedometers. There's lots of research showing that when people can track their walking behavior with a pedometer, that they walk more. Um, and the, re the research question here was um, especially about social comparison. So not just having the feedback from your pedometer, but it being able to compare how you're walking compared to other people um, with, that, uh, with that increase the amount that you walked. So these were university staff people who all signed up for a study to increase their, their walking. And they spent one week with a sealed pedometer so we could get their baseline amount of walking, but they wouldn't have any feedback. And then we randomly assigned them to either control condition or social comparison condition. And they spent two weeks in that active phase with the open pedometer where they could track their amount of walking um, and either get this social comparison information or not. Um, they, this, this was like old style clip on the belt uh, pedometers, nothing, no fancy activity trackers. So at the end of each day, they were supposed to go to this Google spreadsheet and fill in the reading of their pedometer at the end of the day and also the time that they had put it on and taken it off for the day. Um, 
And then the people in the social, for the people in the control group, it was really boring. They just typed in the information they already knew about how many steps they had walked that day. For the people in the social comparison group, um, this message would flop, uh, would, would uh, pop up about you did worse than 79% of other people or you did better than 87% of other people. Um, and that was accurate feedback. We were actually comparing their step, the increase in their steps walk from baseline to a previous study we had run with the same population. So we had a distribution and we knew um, what the percentile was for that um, number of steps walk. And of course, nobody likes to be told they're doing worse than most other people. Uh, so that's how it's supposed to work. Um, and th so this graph shows the steps per day for the control group and the social comparison group. The baseline is the white bar and the, and the, during the intervention period is the red bar. And the people that got the social comparison uh, feedback walked uh, 1,500 steps more than the people in the control group. Okay, um, so those are my first two categories. I'm about to talk about automation, which is the, I guess the thing we're really supposed to be talking about because that was in the title. Um, bef before we do that transition, does anybody want to ask any questions at this point? Okay, that's fine. You can ask questions at the end. I know you've been like well culturated to save your questions. To the end. Um, okay, so what I mean by automation is intervening on behavior directly. So we're not gonna to try to change people's attitudes or beliefs or emotions, we're just gonna to try to change their behavior. Uh, so one example of this would be Ali Kemp's work on reminders and recalls. Um, so here's an example of one of her studies where um, patients actually either got these reminders uh, or didn't, it was for the behavior was HPV vaccination. So once you had the first dose, did you get a recall notice that you were due for the second and third dose? Um, and you can see in the intervention column there that vaccination rates are higher than in the, in the control intervention. So why is this an example of automation? Well, we're like, we're automating the prompt um, to cue the behavior. So the patient no longer has to deliberately think like, oh yeah, it's been 30 days since my first HPV dose, I need to go back and get it. That part is automated for them. They just get the reminder, oh, remember you have this appointment in two days, like come in and get it. Um, or you missed your appointment, you're due for it, you know, um, let's schedule another appointment for you. So that reminder function has been automated for them. They don't have to spend their own cognitive resources doing that. Uh, uh, another example from Allie's work, uh, this is um, also vaccination. So received any vaccination or received uh, all the vaccinations up to date status. Um, um, so everybody's uh, increasing. The bars on the left was a centralized um, system of sending out the reminders. Uh, with, and that works slightly better than the physician-based reminders just because the centralized system was actually more effective at actually getting the reminders out there. Um, so that's actually kind of like a, a meta automation example because we're automating it for the physician practice. They don't have to implement the reminders. The centralized service is going to send out the reminders for them. So we're making it easier for the patients and we're even making it easier for the physicians as well. All right, probably the most classic example of automation is the default effect, which I'm sure a lot of you um, are already familiar with. So the default is the thing that you will get if you don't take explicit action. And the default effect is the tendency for people to, to stick with the default rather than um, taking an explicit action to get something else. And this figure shows the famous Johnson and Goldstein's um, study on organ donation rates. So the y-axis here is the percent of people in different countries um, who are designated as organ donors. And the, the yellow countries on the left are all presumed consent countries. So in those countries, the default is that you will not be an organ donor. You have to explicitly opt in and sign up to be an organ donor if you want to be one. The blue countries on the right are all um, presumed consent countries. So these are countries where the default is that you will be an organ donor and you have to explicitly opt out and say that you don't want to be an organ donor if you don't want to be one. And of course, you, it, the figure makes obvious that it has a huge effect on the number of people who are designated as organ donors. Less clear on whether it actually affects the number of organs really available for transplant, but certainly in terms of this decision, it has a big influence. Um, okay, here's another example. This is Mitesh Patel's study. 
at the University of Pennsylvania med school system, um, the electronic health record system that physicians used for ordering prescriptions um, didn't have the generic medication option set as the default uh, before the intervention happened. Um, so the intervention was setting the default uh, to be the generic medication. Um, and as you can see, prescriptions of the generic version of a whole bunch of different classes of medications went up dramatically after they made this change and stayed up. Um, so that's obviously a great cost saving um, outcome. Here's a similar study that has maybe more of a life saving outcome. So in this study, a, a similar idea of changing the defaults in the automatic uh, prescription ordering system here it was the default for opioid prescriptions. Uh, so what's the default number of pills in, in the opioid prescription? Uh, and before they implemented the intervention, it was 30 pills was the default. Um, after they uh, instituted the intervention, the default was 12 pills. Uh, and th the number of act pills actually prescribed fell from a median of 20 to a median of 12. Um, so, of course, patients can always get refills if they need more, but they're less likely to have extra opioids left over after their surgery or whatever is, is finished that they could wind up getting addicted to. Um, okay, so uh, let me tell you a, about a study on flu shot defaults that I did. Um, Mung was on this study as well. Uh, so we got patients from a general internal medicine practice and randomized them to three conditions. Uh, an opt-in condition where they got a letter saying flu shots are available and here's how you can make an appointment for one. An opt-out condition that said flu shots are available and we've pre-scheduled you for an appointment on Thursday at 7.30. Here's how to cancel it if you don't want that appointment. And then a no letter control that didn't get any communication. Uh, so, um, so there's our three conditions. So the first thing we can look, just look at is how many people had an appointment. Um, and not surprisingly, in the opt-out condition where they had an appointment pre-scheduled for them, a lot more people ended up with an appointment than in the, in the conditions where people would have to explicitly call in to make an appointment. Um, but notice that almost half of the people in the opt-out condition did call in to cancel their appointment. So people were feeling pretty free to do that, just like a bunch of them kept the appointment. Um, then the next thing we can look at is the number of people who came in to get vaccinated at the special early morning flu clinics that were the topic of the letter. Uh, and you can see that we have a higher vaccination rate in the opt-out group than in the two control groups. Um, notice that the vaccination rate in the opt-out group is not fantastically high. It's just, I mean, well, all right, it's three times as high, so it's great that way, but it's still only 16%. Um, so there were 164 people that had appointments and only 47 of them actually got a flu shot. So what happened to everyone else? Um, so there was a really high no-show rate of people who got the letter saying that they had this automatically scheduled appointment, didn't cancel the appointment, but then also didn't show up for the appointment. So that is a cost of using this kind of default appointment system is that people may not show up for the appointment. And so and if you're holding space open for them in the clinic, that can be a cost to the clinic. Uh, so our letters were about these early morning flu clinic hours when people could get a flu shot. Um, it was also possible for uh, patients to get a flu shot if they came to a regular doctor's office visit for a general physical or to get their blood pressure checked or talk about their hypertension or like any of the bazillion reasons that people come to a doctor's office visit, they could get a flu shot as long as they were there as well. And those, that kind of vaccination was not the topic of our automatically scheduled appointments, but we did have data on who got vaccinated um, in that venue and you know, a reasonable number of people did. And our letter manipulation didn't have any effect on those vaccinations. So that shows how localized the, the, the default manipulation is. It's really about having this appointment um, already set to get a flu shot and sort of the path of least resistance is to just keep that appointment and then show up for it. It's not about sort of some higher level inference of, hmm, my doctor must really want me to get a flu shot if she sent me this letter with this automatic appointment. So I'll be more likely to get the flu shot in any venue. Nope, just the venue where we're setting the default. Uh, this is the same data, but in a graph, if you want to look at it that way. Um, so the, the opt-out group on the left has a higher total height of the bar and also a, a taller blue part of the of the bar um, so an increased total vaccination and the red parts of the bars 
have a slight tendency to be lower for the opt-out, but that's not statistically real. The red parts are statistically equivalent across the threes. Yes? Just a really quick question. Sure. I'm afraid I'll forget if I wait sure. to the end with all the different sites. Um, does you guys have access to data at all on um, people getting flu shots in pharmacies? You can get flu shots. I'm um, thinking people find themselves yeah. in pharmacies for all kinds of different reasons or picking up paper towels or, you know, whatever, and if they can be... Yep. Yeah. Good point. Um, and of course, the convenience of getting out of pharmacy is a great intervention to increase flu shots. We we sent a questionnaire to all of the patients asking them, did they get a flu shot anywhere? And if so, where? Okay. Only about a third of the people return that questionnaire. So we may have some selection effects. Uh, what we found from the questionnaire responses that we had was that um, similar to these findings, the Default manipulation increased total vaccinations, but had no effect on off-site vaccinations at pharmacy, workplace, or things like that. So again, it seemed to be a very localized effect. But yeah, we were interested in that question. I wish we had even better data than the self-report responses that we had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am really interested in pharmacy um, vaccination. Um, okay, so that's the uh, vaccination default study. Um, and one of the first couple slides, I mentioned another automation technique called implementation intentions. Um, so here's the example of that. So this is a study Katie Milkman did at a, with a big company that had multiple work sites. And the company was already sending postcards to people telling them that there were free flu shots available um, at, the, at the workplace. And so what they manipulated in the experiment was whether they prompted people to make a plan about exactly when that they would come to make, to get their flu shot. So you see the control postcard on the left. In the middle, they just plan which date, because a lot of sites had multiple dates um, when you could come to get a flu shot. Uh, and so you would just, you, you, they have no way of knowing if people filled this in, but they were prompted to pick a date when they would come. And then the right hand um, postcard also asked them for a time of day. So, you know, I'm gonna come on Wednesday, right after lunch, something like that. Uh, and then here are the actual vaccination rates. Um, so you can see on the left across all sites, the two shaded bars that um, prompted people to make a plan have a small but statistically real increase in vaccination rates. Um, basically all of that effect comes from the employment sites where there was only a single day to get a flu shot. Uh, and a post hoc reason for that could be that you really wanna make a plan and keep a plan if you only have one opportunity to get the flu shot. There's only one day when they're offering it. Whereas if you're at a work site that's offering the flu shot multiple days, maybe you don't feel so obliged to keep the plan that you set for yourself because, well, I could just get it the next day. It's, they're still gonna be there. And then of course you don't get it the next day. Um, we, don't know if, we don't know for sure if that's true, but that seems plausible. Um, okay, oh, so the way in which, let me, let me say why this is an example of automation. If a planning prompt works, um, you're automating the behavior because now the environment has taken control of the plan. So uh, the patient or the work, the employee doesn't have to deliberatively say like, oh, cost and benefits of the flu shot. Yes, I should get a flu shot and here it is. And when should I get a flu shot? They've already made that plan. So once the plan is in place, it's supposed to proceed automatically. So I've decided that Wednesday on my way back to my office after lunch, I always pass the occupational health department between the cafeteria and my office, so that's gonna be my, my prompt to do it. And so I just, I find myself walking back from lunch on Wednesday and there's the occupational health office and I'm like, oh, right, the queue that I had set in place and, and, I, and I walk in. Okay, um, let's talk about recommendations. So um, for vaccination, there's a lot of literature showing that uh, physician recommendations are very strongly associated with getting a, a flu shot. Uh, a lot of that data is correlational. You just ask people whether they got a recommendation from their physician or not, and whether they got a flu shot or not, there's a big correlation. And you don't really know, like, are the physicians recommending to the people who uh, were most likely to get the flu shot anyway, or are they most likely to remember, patients most likely to remember that they got a recommendation if they get, did get the flu shot? Um, so it's really cool when you can do a randomized experiment on recommendations. Um, so this is a neat study that Noel Brewer did. He was our senior author on that big paper that Allie and I wrote together. Um, uh, so what was randomized was what kind of recommendation the physician gave and, a, and HPV vaccination was the behavior. 
Um, so rather than just doing the sort of usual, hey, let's talk about HPV vaccination and I, let's answer your questions and I recommend it, it for you. Um, that was the control condition. In the experimental condition, the physician delivered what they call a presumptive recommendation, meaning we're presuming, of course, you're gonna get the HPV vaccine because it's standard of care, just like, you know, we don't recommend that your kid is due for the HPV vaccination, we're, we'll give that at the end of, of, the, of the appointment today. Uh, and then of course, if the patient has questions, um, you address those questions and concerns. And if the patient doesn't want to do it, it doesn't sign the form, of course you don't, don't give it, but you kind of, you act as if, of course we're going to do this because it's standard of care. Um, so move away from the feedback zone. Um, so that this, this table shows the results. Um, so it's this, well, focus on this middle um, column. That's the increase in coverage from the previous three months after they started doing this experiment. So the, the announcement, that's the presumptive recommendation. So it went up about twice as much there than um, in the conversation condition, which is the, the sort of standard recommendation of let's talk about HPV and see if you want to do it. Uh, this is a, a figure from the article that kind of outlines um, uh, what the presumptive announcement training was. So you, you know, you announce that your kid is due and then you, um, unless something else happens, you deliver the vaccine. But of course you go down and answer questions about vaccination if the patient wants it, as opposed to the sort of conversation um, method where you start the conversation and talk about a lot of things. And then at the end of it, you recommend and see if the patient wants to do it. Um, so the, what I like about presumptive recommendations is that they're kind of like a default version of a recommendation. So you still have like the authority and the social norm aspect of the recommendation, but there's, the, there's this default aspect to it that unless the, the patient um, expresses an explicit concern that we're just going to go with the standard of care and give that to you. Uh, okay, so here's my summary slide of all the things that we just talked about and I'm going to be really interested in your thoughts about which ones you think are most plausible in the context that you study. So in terms of presenting information, behavioral research indicates that the way in which you present information can be just as important as the content of the information. So the way you frame the information or presenting the information in a way that's particularly easy for the patient to process um, are techniques that we can use. Um, in terms of social comparison, uh, it's, not that, um, it's not that giving people explicit incentives for their behavior is a bad thing, but that's not always scalable. There's like some expense to that. Um, whereas uh, setting and maintaining a social norm, while not always easy, at least doesn't have the explicit monetary costs of, of an incentive. Uh, so giving people social comparison information to other people that are doing better than them, um, can create in them an incentive to want to do better or social norm information about what everyone else is doing, especially if everyone else is doing the thing you want the patient to do. It can backfire. If, if no one else is getting vaccinated, then telling people that no one else is getting vaccinated is not going to motivate them. Um, but if you, yeah, if you get a context where everyone else is doing the behavior, um, you can motivate them. And those kind of social consequences of behavior uh, are probably at least as important to humans as the, the more um, objective, explicit consequences that you know, we give, like we're gonna give you a $5 gift card if you get vaccinated. Um, and then finally, we can look for these ways to automate the behavior where the environment can take over guiding the behavior. So reminders and prompts mean that the patient doesn't have to explicitly figure out when to exhibit the behavior. The prompt tells them when to exhibit the behavior. As long as they're, they're positively predisposed to the behavior to begin with, um, the reminder that we give them can then trigger that behavior that you're supposed to do it now. Um, defaults very explicitly set the the automated thing to be, I mean, that's kind of almost the definition of a default. It's the thing that automatically happens if you don't take any explicit behavior. Um, so rather than making people explicitly schedule appointments for mammograms and annual exams and dental exams and, and flu shots, if those things are just scheduled for them, that takes some of the work away from them. And it may also sort of communicate a, a bit of social norm that presumably your healthcare provider wants you to do these things if these appointments are getting um, scheduled for you. Uh, implementations intentions uh, kind of put the cognitive work earlier in the stream. Like the patient does have to make a plan, 
um, and we can prompt them to make that plan. But once the plan is in, in place, then the behavior is supposed to roll out automatically when they run into the queue um, that they've determined to be their prompt. Uh, and recommendations, uh, well, recommendations are probably a mix of a lot of things, information, social norm influence about what the physician, physician wants you to do, and then also a sort of automated prompt of, oh, I'm supposed to do it right now, because the physician is saying, here, we're recommending this and this, we're doing that. We're recommending that you do this thing, get this vaccine or whatever. Um, a presumptive recommendation, as I said a few minutes ago, has this kind of nice combination of all of those recommendation features plus a default feature uh, where the recommendation communicates that the vaccine is the default thing to do, the thing that we, it's our standard of care that of course we're gonna do unless you object. Okay, so um, thanks very much for your attention and I'm really looking forward to your questions and discussion. <laughs> Almost automated. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So, did you do any sort of like sub analysis for the people who are getting feedback? Like, you're doing worse than you know 88 percent people versus like the people that are getting feedback. They're doing like better than 88 percent of people, but you know maybe they're still not doing as much as they should. Did those people that got the other feedback like stay the same or walk less? Or yeah, that's a really good question that we were very curious about. In the original Cialdini studies about electricity use, he found this resting on your laurels effect that if you found out that you were doing better than other people, then you're like, oh, I can slack off. Where if you thought, found out you were doing worse than other people, that's what motivated you to improve. Um, so we wanted to know if we had that kind of a, a effect. Our, the way we designed our study was not probably ideal for looking at the effect, the feedback that people got was based on their improvement from baseline. So the way we did the analysis to address this, let me see if I can remember this, um, we, we looked at both people that got everybody control and social comparison people. On the previous day, um, did your walking behavior give you a message that you were doing better than other people or worse than other people, or would it have given that um, message if you, like for control people, would that have been the social comparison message you would have gotten if we had given you? So did you do worse or better than people on day D minus one? And then on day D, um, uh, how much did you walk? And we wanted to know whether the control social comparison difference would be biggest when on the previous day you did worse than everyone else. But, and maybe possibly even reverse if you, if on the previous day you did better than everyone else and you're like, oh, I can rest on my laurels. Um, and we didn't find that. We found that the control social comparison difference was identical in, in effect size, regardless of how, how you did on the previous day. Um, but we didn't, the reason why that's not a perfect test is we were not experimentally manipulating whether, like we could have done a deception study where we, where we experimentally manipulate whether people are told they're doing better or worse than other people. That would have given us the pure experimental control and that was, we didn't do that in this study. But great question. Yes. Um, yes, thank you for the very interesting talk. Do you have any information or strategies that would help to improve adherence for persons with chronic conditions? I, yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, and part of what makes it so difficult is it's not a one-time behavior change, it's a sustained behavior change. And that is the really puzzling challenge for behavioral scientists. So vaccination is a bit like a one-time change. I mean, a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of vaccines we have to get, but for any particular vaccine, it's like once in a lifetime or three doses and you're done. Like flu shot is maybe even the most onerous that you have to do it every year. But if you have to take medication every day or eat special foods at every single meal three times a day, that's a really sustained behavior change to make. Um, so we can employ some of these techniques like prompts and reminders or defaults or social comparisons, but how long are they really gonna last? Uh, I think that's a critical question that we don't know the answer to yet. Um, 
Katie Milkman, who did the implementation intention study that I mentioned, has this really great study that's currently ongoing uh, with 24-hour fitness, so exercise or attending the gym, presumably that means exercise behavior, is the outcome measure. Um, and there are like 20 different studies, sub-studies involved in this study. So um, fitness members sign up to be in the study and then they get randomized to one of the 20 different studies and then one of the different arms within those studies. And these studies use all kinds of different techniques about incentives and social prompts and information and all kinds of things. Um, and they, they get the intervention for a month, but then they get followed for a year after that. Um, so the, the recruitment is just about done. So it's gonna be another year until we have the outcome data. Um, but a key question is which of these different interventions work best during the one month period, but then also which of them work best like 12 months later? So I'm hoping that study's gonna give us some good information. Yes. Dr. Chapman, thank you so much. Forgive me, this is a little self-serving in my question. But Fine. I hear a lot of uh, technology and some prompts. And the reason I ask is uh, I represent a group called Ingenious, and we're now at a mm -hmm. center for software development here at the university. And uh, really working a lot in healthcare to help researchers and uh, physical investigators create new apps and new technology. Have you um, found a disconnect at all between the, the theories that you've used and the development of new apps and technology to drive? these same behaviors? Well, I definitely think that technology is an incredibly great venue for implementing some of these behavior science uh, ideas. The, the challenge of sustained behavior change is as present there as it is anywhere. Um, so keeping your users engaged with the app so they keep looking at it and keep getting influenced by it in, in, the, in the long term it is a challenge. Um, there are some existing technologies that already make use of some of the ideas that I talked about, like the Fitbit app will show me how I'm walking compared to other friends that and I have to pick the friends. And maybe we'd be better pick them for me to be make sure I was really comparing myself. But I, I mean, I have that, that leaderboard of the social comparison. Um, so that would be one example. Um, I, I showed you a couple examples of use of electronic health records to change physician behavior. So that's another technology relevant behavior. Do you have particular technology driven nudges in mind that you're I interested in? I mean, Bethany has been phenomenal in helping us look at the theory of behavior change, especially around medical appearance, for example. Mm -hmm solution, but I don't want to take up too much time. If anybody's interested, I have some information, but um, we're, we're very interested in all the innovation that's occurring, and I know a lot of it is about technology. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. How do you even give yeah, the, um, the center at Penn, the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics, has this way to, ways to health, way to health, way to health platform that they call um, automated hovering. So it's a platform where you can send text to patients and get um, text back. Um, patients can like Bluetooth in their weight or how long they sit brushing their teeth. Um, there are, I don't know, there are probably other features like that that I can't remember. Um, but it's a great platform for using technology to implement some of these behavioral interventions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Bethany. So just to uh, say a little bit more about what Kevin was describing, for this project that we have on uh, adolescent liver transplant medication in parents, we're trying to gamify implementation. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. um, so incorporating this idea of making a plan and teaching people how to make plans. And it is these adolescents that have a chronic condition that are taking it every day for the rest of their lives. How do you teach them the skill of planning um, and make it fun? Um, so you didn't talk much about the, the emotion part of, of automatic behavior, the emotion part of behavior change. Um, but I, I wonder if, if you have any thoughts about that you know, gamification. Oh, yeah, I really like that. Automation. Yeah, the 24-hour fitness study that Katie Milkman's doing that I mentioned does have some studies on implementation prompts. Not surprisingly, that's her thing. Um, but I, I, I don't think anybody is doing that interesting angle of making it fun to make the plan. Um, I mean, a lot of apps will like give you points. I have a almost 16 year old, so I was quickly researching like safe driving apps. And so one of the ones I tried out, um, uh, you know, give, gives me points for my safe driving. So there are a lot of apps that, that do that, but actually making getting the points really fun is 
there's some there's some technique there that I think if you do it right, you could have a much bigger influence. Just to follow up once again, the, the interesting thing about ingenious is we incorporate the science that you're talking about, the human behavior uh, science, into the product design mm -hmm. of new technologies. That's great. Uh, but it's a talent. As you, talk about. you had a question, yes. Yeah, I was just wondering about any attempts your team has made to try and establish why some people are less susceptible to these kinds of interventions. So, when you get a postcard in the mail that says your flu shot appointment is 12 noon on Wednesday, you know, perhaps it's the people who are retired or something mm -hmm. who are more able to adhere to that. Or there could be something ideological where you're told something about social norming, but you're politically libertarian. Mm -hmm. And so you have a sort of intrinsic resistance to that. So, so I'm just wondering about, I'm, I'm just speculating. Yeah, those are great questions. There is very little research on heterogeneity and the effects of these kind of interventions, but that we, we clearly need to get on that. And the flu shot default study I described, um, we, there were a few things that we could look at um, because it was a pragmatic trial and patients didn't consent into it. We didn't have a lot of information about them, but we knew their gender and their age and uh, oh, some, well, the ones who did the questionnaire gave us permission to access their medical charts, and so we need their comorbidities for that, that portion of them. And none of those things moderated the effect. The default effect was equally large for, for all of us. But we were curious about whether it would be more effective for some subgroups than others. Um, yeah, and, and to be able to do a, a large pragmatic trial where you have measures, good measures of moderators, like that's gold. Like we should jump on those opportunities. I'm going to move to this side for just a minute. Yeah. I have a question about how social contact is potentially complex with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, great point. Social context is a double-edged sword because we want to do what people around us are doing, and if they're not doing the right thing, we, we want to do that. Um, the, like, you know, there's the, uh, there's the data on obesity kind of being infectious in the sense that, like, people who are obese have other ob obese people in their social networks. Uh, in the paper Allie and I wrote, uh, we talk about how uh, people who are very adamantly opposed to vaccination are small in number, and in some sense, we'll get more bang for the bet go going for the people who are just sort of disorganized and don't get around to it. But the people who are adamantly opposed to vaccination tend to congregate in the same social networks, either ge geographically or at least who they communicate with. And so they can be extra influential because of that. Um, and of course, those attitudes are really, really hard to, to change. So there's no, there's no easy answer there. Um, I mean, sometimes you can you can get people into different social networks or you can introduce a, a social voice like a celebrity that has a big influence but in the correct direction but you know it's it's not trivial to make that work yes in the vaccination default study that was a uh, med school faculty practice. Um, so these were middle class, well insured patients. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, linking back to the previous part of the conversation about heterogeneity of effects, yeah, it's really important to look at whether these effects are, uh, are larger in some populations than others. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interventions, implications for how we educate physicians about communication, because most curricula right now actually, I would say, anti-train or presumptive that they're that's not being considered by the ethics, and that's secondarily, does anyone look at data with regard to patient experience or patient satisfaction based on these things? 
Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I well, I take your point that physicians are not trained to give presumptive recommendations, but I think that there's uh, variance across what they're recommending. So there's um, at least some anecdotal data that pediatricians talk about HPV vaccination different from the way they talk about other vaccinations. So like if you're due for an MMR, they'll just say like you're due for an MMR, like please sign here. But if it's HPV, then they feel like oh, they have to have this conversation and talk about whether you want it. And part of that is maybe because it's not required for schools. So they view it as more um, optional. And part of it may be because uh, it's a sexually transmitted virus and they feel like that's a more sticky topic. Um, but if they could just be as presumptive as they are for all the other standard of care things, for HPV vaccination, which for which the compliance rates are low, like you know, even that would be a great boon. Um, in terms of patient satisfaction, that's a really great question. I could see that going either way or different ways for different people. Yes. Yep. Yeah, he did the initial study. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Yeah, Doug Opal, he did a previous study before the Brewer study. The Brewer study was a better experimental design, but the Opal study would, um, was the first one. Yes. Hmm. I can't think of one, but the, there's got to be one though. It's such, yeah, sorry, I can't think of one at the moment. Yes. So you want to increase participation in clinical trials or just in any kind of study? Okay. Um, well, I would certainly think that different ways of framing or presenting the consent form could have an influence if patients actually read the consent form. They could be influenced by that if they weren't reading it. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the advantage of pragmatic trials is that patients are in the trial by default unless they opt out, but they, you can only use that for um, uh, very low risk uh, studies. So that's not going to be the answer for everything. But obviously, that's a great example of the default effect. I think there's a lot of really interesting research to be done on inferences that potential participants make about a study based on the consent form. Like if it's as long as the IRB tells me it has to be, does that subtly communicate to them this is a super risky study when in fact it's really not that risky? Um, so I don't have any easy answers for you, but I, I think it's a great research question in and of itself. All right, Are thank we you. We're okay. done. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> um, and if you want to bring your evaluations to the front of the room or just leave them where they are and we'll pick them up. So. Are there any more evaluations? Um, yep, looks like there's a few. All right. <laughs>